Paul, people use several terms for the thing we're interested in, computer art, digital art, uh, new media art, net art and so on. Do you have strong feelings about any of them, for or against? I've got fairly strong feelings against all of them. <laughs> and I guess that's because I was educated in a time when there was no digital art. So I was educated as an artist. Mm. And I remember uh, Harold Cohen became a friend later in life. And he was adamant that he didn't want to be called anything but an artist. And I think he's right. Um, yes, it can be useful to have a phrase like digital art, electronic art, but we don't talk about acrylic paint art. We don't talk about oil paint art. I mean, we, maybe we talk about printmaking. But it seems to me the big problem with any of those terms, they can very easily turn into dustbins. So you can actually use digital art or computer art as a place to sort of encapsulate this stuff and put it to one side where you can forget about it. Yes. And so I, 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 yes, they're useful shorthand. Um, digital art, electronic art, I guess, would be my preferred terms. I think algorithmic art is one that's taken off recently amongst many of my peers um, so as a possibility. Sort of isn't it, it is, yeah, and you have to know yeah. obviously what an algorithm is yes. and, and, and so on. Um, so basically I'm an artist and I, like to, I would like to be recognised as an artist. Okay. I wonder if you'd mind just summarising your own contribution to the arts in the, in the course of your career. I discovered computers fairly early. I saw cybernetic serendipity in 1968. Um, and then I'd already been to college, I'd dropped out, was working in light shows, and um, <coughs> realized seeing cybernetic serendipity that here was a tool, a medium, call it what you will, that was suitable for me to use. It, 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 it fit with my ideas of what I wanted to do as an artist. Um, so I, I went back to college, I, I, I made use of this little loophole when the government um, amalgamated the small independent colleges, so the College of Engineering, the College of Printmaking, the College of Art and so on, to form the Polytechnics, which was essentially an economic move, they just wanted one budgetary element. What it meant was that you could go to college as an artist and then walk down the road to the maths or engineering department and ask them to teach you how to program mm. and that's what I did. Um, so I went back to, to, to art college, um, joined the sculptors, I, I, I'm not particularly a sculpture, sculptor but um, they were much more sympathetic to the idea of using computers than the painters were so uh, uh, and I spent most of my time in the maths department and the engineering department learning to program a variety of computers and then went on did some postgraduate work and then when I graduated from the Slade uh, in 79, um, I walked in the job shop, I had two small children, toddlers at that time, walked in the, uh, the, the, the local job shop and uh, they pulled this little card out and said, um, would you like to work in Hilversum? And so two days later I was on the plane to Hilversum and got interviewed um, by a company who were product designers, packaging mainly food stuff, tobacco, alcohol, food stuff, uh, called Classens. And they had a very sophisticated analog system for producing variations on artwork. It had all these cameras looking at black and white artwork, and they were all mixed through a vision mixer with, with color controls so they could inject color, um, put italics on things, and so on. And it was very unstable, like any large analog device. It, um, it, it needed constant maintenance. And they'd been told, well, if you do this digitally, it's a lot more stable. And, and so they'd put this call out. If you get anybody who knows about art and design and computers, grab them. And so uh, <coughs> I, uh, I went to work for Classens. And that, for a period of time, I was developing what would have, what was, the Stades, it was called, uh, one of the first ever computer systems that had been specifically designed for designers to use. Mm. And um, it was a sad tale because the, 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 the Astadis came out, um, and then the next year the Apple Macintosh came out, and the Astadis cost, oh, <coughs> the cheapest version was over a quarter of a million. Mm. And of course the Macintosh was probably then about 10, 15,000. Mm. So um, fortunately, Clarsons had sold the rights to it to another company before this happened, so they, they might not have lost out on it. But um, because of that, I became very closely involved as, as an artist, as a fine artist, with the design community. And so I spent quite a few years after that uh, in academia, um, 
developing programs, educational programs for designers, because at that time, when I went into academia, graphic designers were saying, oh, never mind about computers, it's just a fad, they'll go away, you know. <laughs> and I'd realised, and a few people had realised, this is not going to go away, it's absolutely essential if these kids coming into college today are going to have a job in five years' time, they must know how to use computers. And so I spent time in England, um, in, in, in America, in Australia, um, developing these programs for uh, universities uh, to introduce designers mm. to, um, to computing. And what, ironically, by that time, um, computers had become very unfashionable in the fine art world. The postmodernists had come in. Mm. Computers were seen as something that scientists used to make weapons, mm. and artists that mixed with those sort of people weren't worthy of, of being called artists. And so, ironically, I hardly worked with any fine art students during that period, mm. um, but worked with fashion designers, interior designers, textile designers, a um, lot of graphic designers, filmmakers, mm. um, in, in a variety of different universities and schools. You've in fact written um Quite movingly, I thought, in, in, your, in your chapter in White Heat, Cold Logic, uh, about the difficulties of actually getting access to a computer in, in an art school um, and, and you know, how the things you had to make do with uh, in the early days. But presumably, um, you, you've seen things turn full circle, haven't you, in, in the course of your career? Mm -hmm. um, did, did you, f I mean, presumably, you must have felt something of an outsider at, at the beginning. You, know, you, you were the, the chap who wanted to do fine arts on a computer, and you, as you say, this was regarded as somehow not quite right. I, I don't know if I felt like an outsider. I, I, I uh, you know, was an arrogant young man and I thought I was right and everybody else was wrong. Um, but I think a lot of us felt that we were part of a movement that would change the art world. Mm -hmm. So this is the 70s, um, the, the late period of, of European high modernism, if you like. Mm -hmm. And we were part of that community that had come out of systems art and art concrete and stuff like that. And we really felt that we were the future, that we were designing the future. And what actually happened is that by the turn of the, the 80s, um, a whole new younger generation of um, curators and critics had evolved, um, who'd come out of um, universities that never used computers, and they owed their allegiance to uh, Jenks, the whole postmodern ideal and postmodernism. And they felt that computers were the antithesis of the right thing. They, they were things that scientists used to make weapons and were not appropriate tools for artists. And from that point on, so certainly from the beginning of the 80s, it became increasingly more difficult for artists who are using computers um, to, uh, to, to, to be seen in the normal traditional art world environments. And I suppose at that time in response to that, we'd already recognized an international community of artists mm. working in the field. And we began to set up artist initiatives, some of which were national, like the Australian Network for Art and Technology, which I chaired for several years. Some were international, like the International Symposium on Electronic Art and um, the SIGGRAPH Art Show. Mm -hmm. um, but we were really sustained through that whole period um, by uh, um, that community and we could meet each other, we could go to these meetings, we could meet each other. We had opportunities to show our work and critique our work and publish our work through Leonardo Journal, which was part of that whole movement. Um, and that, that really kept us alive through that period. And then, uh, well, White Heat was the outcome of a research project that we did at Birkbeck. Charlie Gear was the, um, the, the leader on that project. Uh, Nick was part of the project, I was part, and Catherine Mason. And um, about that time, this would have been 2003-04, we talked to the Tate, we talked to the V&A and set up a very healthy relationship which goes on to this day with the Victorian Albert Museum. And I think one of the things that I realised, that I hadn't realised before was, that if you're not recognised by the art world, you get forgotten about us, you know, even before you're dead. And I'd seen that happen to too many people. And, and the other thing uh, was that, um, the, 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 the art world was waking up mm. to the whole digital thing. They didn't know how to handle it. They still don't know how to handle it. Mm. Um, but they were thinking, maybe we better not miss out. Mm. And there's been a few attempts since then to sort of get on board some sort of fad like net art or whatever it is by the, by the big art world. Yes. Um, but they haven't really taken it on board wholeheartedly in the sense yeah. that I would have liked them to do. You said just now you were conscious of a movement that would, being part of a movement that would change the art world. And, and you also said in 
an essay called An Emergent Paradigm that you wrote a, a few years ago that it's, it's um, somewhere in the middle years of the next decade we should begin to see a new language, a new aesthetic, a new paradigm emerge. Can we possibly foresee what form it may take? I mean, is it emerging? Um, well, it, it, it emerged in a, in a small off-Broadway, off-centre <laughs> community. So we became a small pond and, and within that small pond there's obviously big fish and, and the smaller fish but it had good academic <coughs> credibility. A lot of universities were starting courses that addressed the area. Um, the Leonardo Journal which Frank Molina had set up in the, the 60s when his, his, his son is still running out of MIT Press. I mean that's an A1 journal that gives you the highest possible brownie points for publishing and it's a top top accredited journal and so we, we were able to to get our work out there but unfortunately not too many people were listening we were really talking to ourselves and we certainly didn't change the art world I don't think and it is maybe changing now a little bit but I still think they have significant problems we talked earlier about photography mm. um, there were significant problems in the art world with photography because you've got a negative you can make an infinite number of prints how can you possibly justify charging 30,000 for a print, and so one of the ways is to tear the print up, or, or tear the negative up, or stamp a hole in it, like the recent show at the Whitechapel Gallery. Um, and, and I think the same thing happens for, for the digital art. And so now, for example, I'm being asked by galleries, do I have any of my old plotter drawings? Because they know that those are few on the ground, you can't reproduce them. And so they can put value on, and uh, we, I think we both saw the show at the Mayer Gallery yes, yes. just a few weeks ago, where prices of 3,500 up to 54,000 mm. were being charged for single, mm. single plots from that mm. particular period. Mm. You, you made a, a, what I thought was a, a good point I've never seen before, actually, in, in, uh, again in your White Heat Cold Logic essay, that, that um, there's a difference between computer art, where the computer is acting as a kind of tool that just expands what the human can mm. do, and what you might call computational mm, art, mm. where you're actually using the computer to produce a, a separate aesthetic. Yeah. Um, yeah. And obviously, photography and that sort of thing is a good example mm. of computer Absolutely. art. Absolutely. Yeah. But do you think computational art is, 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 is in this more established field now? But certainly, in terms of the number of people that are, mm. that are using it, there's a, there's a lot of young people now mm. looking at the whole computational and generative aesthetic and, and doing some very, very interesting work. Mm. Photography is interesting because if you look at the development of photography from those very first experiments mm. by Daguerre and Fox mm. Talbot and mm. the, 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 the Napice and the pioneers, originally they used photography to copy paintings. Mm. Mm. And it was only after Margaret Cameron comes mm. along, about a 40-year hiatus, mm. Mm. that we see photographs that are photographs. They're not pretending mm. to be paintings. They're not pretending to be something else. They're, 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 they're establishing the medium of photography in its own right. Now, I, th acting in my sort of messianic role in, 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 the, in the 80s and the 90s when I was in education, I was trying to get across to people how important this was mm. and I talked a lot about that 40 year hiatus mm. and having seen my own kids grow up mm. I realized that 40 years is really a generation mm. because what will happen is after 40 years you've got a whole community of young artists who can't remember life before yes. Yes. whereas people like me you know yes. remember a lot of life before so they've grown up entirely in the digital domain yes and so they have a much better understanding of what it is, how it can be used, what they can do with it, where it might go, yes. than an old fart like me, <laughs> who still remembers newspapers and pieces of paper and pens and pencils and yes. stuff. And I think that's the 40-year hiatus. And obviously, we're now over that 40-year hiatus now. We've got these young artists who are now in their 40s, mm. some of them, who are really exploring this domain and, and, and are looking at that. And if I can give a different answer to that question, because the second part, if you like, to the answer is if you look at every discipline that's taken computers on board, the first thing they do is automate their original mm -hmm. practices. So in accounting, mm -hmm. they, they, they copied double entry bookkeeping. Exactly. And there's no need for double entry on a computer. Double entry was two independent people entering it. Mm. So you could cross-reference if there were any mistakes. Mm. And, uh, but, uh, and so these, these new programs came along that mimicked double entry accounting, mm. produced huge amounts of redundancy until somebody was smart enough to think there's a different way to do it on a computer. Architecture was the same. They, they, they automated the drawings. Mm. They got the CAD programs so they could do architectural drawings. Engineering mm. CAD programs so they could automate that. And it wasn't until 
the hiatus period had been over, that this young generation says, hang on, that's not what we do with computers. We can use computers to design whole new buildings and, and, and look at ways of building things that would have been impossible if we didn't have computational help. And of course, Geary was one of the first architects to do that. He didn't himself touch the computers. I visited his studio, oh, many years ago, and he had about 30-odd people who were computational people. They weren't, they weren't architects, and they just carried out his his instructions using big IBM mainframes in a program called CATIA, mm -hmm. the CAD program. And that's how those very early Geary buildings with, with, with fluid surfaces were built, because he worked with corrugated cardboard, but somebody had to convert that into an affordable way of putting a building together. Yeah. And it was those computational programs that, that, that managed to do that. And of course, um, Zaha Hadid, that, that's, that's how they do it these days. They're working completely in the computational domain. Um. Talking about education in the arts, um, it, I've been looking at the way art schools teach digital art or whatever you call it, and it's notable that many of them seem to fit into the category of the computer as a helper, you know, many of the classic mm -hmm. schools. Mm -hmm. And the only one that i found so far in, in the London area that looks at it on the more fundamental basis is Goldsmiths, which mm -hmm. has a course in what yep. they call computational yep. art. Yep. Uh, yep. And it, it, it's, uh, it's fascinating that this d divide still seems to... Mm -hmm. uh, to, to apply. I mean, if, 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 if my impression is correct. I, th I think you're right. I think it's perhaps not just Goldsmiths. I think there are some initiatives in, in, in different places. Uh, Goldsmiths is unique in that the, they decided very, very wisely to put the computer science department and the art department in the same building, mm -hmm. the Pimlet Pim Pim building. And there was a lot of movement of staff between the two departments. Mm -hmm. So um, people who'd really been professors of art um, were put in positions of being professors of computer science. And, and that was a very, very healthy movement backwards and forwards that I think a number of heads of department have, have, have engineered and some very, very good works come out of there. Um, but it is very easy. With Photoshop, you can turn on a computer and do all of these wizard things that um, you could have m maybe done in a dark room, but probably not, you know, unless you were very skilled in a dark room person. Um, so, so a lot of these courses are really just using these off-the-shelf apps to enable people to make that kind of work. And Going back to the history, if you like, I began working when the only output device was a pen plotter, mm -hmm. a repeatograph, and it could, you know, move yeah. around and, yeah. and so, and everybody was using it. So, if you looked at the work, it all had that stamp of pen plotter. Mm -hmm. But you'd go in a room and you'd know immediately who made it, and say, oh, well, that's a Manfred Moore, that's a that's a Frieden Arca, yeah. that's a Harold Cohen, yeah. and so on, because I, I think. It was so hard to do, you had to write your own programs, that there was a mechanism for stamping your own personality or working methodology, whatever it was, on the actual final artwork. So not long after that, 10, 15 years after that, the Macintosh happens, the Windows laptop PC happens, and, and people get these apps now that allow them to, to, to manipulate the images and do drawings and so on. And the very first exhibitions I remember of, of that generation of artists, you went into that exhibition and you didn't say, oh, that's a, by so-and-so. Oh, that was made with Photoshop. That was made with Corel Draw. Mm -hmm. You were identifying the signature mm -hmm. of the application. Mm -hmm. And that, for about 15 years, that dominated the whole scene. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I was one of the people arguing against it, saying, look, you've got to teach people to get closer to the machine. Yes. And then there's all of the kind of kickback against that, that, you know, I don't know how to lift up, you know, take an engine apart to drive a car. Yes. To which my answer was, you know, if you want to be a Formula One, you know, top flight racing driver, or particularly if you're doing driving out in the wild, it probably helps if you know how to, you know, repair the car, mm. uh, or at least how the car works. Now, it, it, it does seem to me that still it's the, it's the people who are taking on the challenge of programming. It's not that hard now. It's certainly not as hard as it was when, when I first began uh, my work. Um, to, to, and the, the beauty about programming is that it gets you that little bit closer to the machine. And the closer you are to the machine, the more you can make use of it, the more you can actually get your message through rather than the message of the apps that have been tailored for you to use. And that's important because I remember when I first started traveling a lot, so this would have been in the, um, in the 80s, mid-80s, late 80s, it was when the electronic paint systems came about, Quantel paint box, 
the digital titling machines, mm -hmm. the little special effects boxes that allowed you to do a picture in picture over the mm -hmm. shoulder, all that kind of stuff. And I suddenly realized it didn't matter where I was in the world, television looked the same. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in, in Taiwan, in Singapore, in America, in Britain, in South America, Australia. And I realized that this is, they were all using effects boxes that had been primarily built in America. Some had been built in Europe. And that those effects boxes had effectively made a language that had become an, a global language. Mm -hmm. And that, in fact, was a, a, almost like an act of cultural imperialism. Yes. And, and, and that did concern me. And I did write a paper about that at one time, that um, you know, ha had that not happened, I think different countries would have, would have actually developed much more unique technologies in terms of their own identity as a country, rather than just adopting this, this standard American, British, mm. you know. Um. It's a very interesting point, and it, it brings me on to another point also, which is about the distribution of art, which has also changed, presumably, because it, it, it is now possible, well, for any sort of uh, pictorial art to, mm. to be viewed uh, and indeed bought and sold over the internet and downloaded from the internet or printed out mm. from the internet. Um, and also some types of, uh, of, of um, kinetic or computational art can also be spread over the internet. Have you found that this makes a difference to your work? Do you mostly uh, access the public through the traditional ways of galleries? And, uh, I, I, I've only just recently started working with galleries, really. Um, uh, almost all of my work has been done through the internet and through special exhibitions like Seagraph, like Isaiah, and I deliver my work on the internet. And, and uh, um, so if, it, if somebody wants to show my work, I actually send files um, over the internet and they uh, then, then deal with the, 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 uh, the destination location. Um, and I think that fits the sort of work that you know, my peer group and myself are doing, that, that we're part of that sort of international network and we know how to use the internet. Mm. It's been interesting to see how the commercial art world has responded to um, the internet. And I think they found out very early on that the the, 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 the the internet, the, the, the sales mechanisms and platforms on the internet, you know, they're very good for, 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 for low cost items and it, they're not very good for luxury items. Mm. It's very hard to sell a Lamborghini mm. on, on the internet. And, and so what the galleries have done, they back room stuff's on the internet. So you'll get a gallery in New York, have a client come in that wants something. They know they've got a partner gallery in England mm -hmm. that's got it and in their their database they've got access to that and they go, oh, if you want to come look at the screen here mm -hmm. sir mm -hmm. you know um, this is this is perhaps what you want and they know that they can be on the phone next day and that can be on a plane over to their gallery but that's um, just your front for a it is player. absolutely yeah yes. yeah so most of your works have been distributed in effect as digital files which obviously can be infinitely copied mm -hmm. so in a sense, the question of original an original Paul Brown, it, it doesn't arise. It, it, it's, um, <coughs> I, I suppose I, excuse me, <coughs> I suppose I come from a generation in the 60s who were very interested in ephemerality of, of, of media. And it wasn't just as um, Stuart Brisley was doing art where he sat on a chair and vomited over himself and yes. dug a hole and fixed it full of... Uh, pig's blood and An sat in it. Known, but not too much. And, 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 and so th at that time, I guess, for many of us, the ephemerality of the artwork was an important mm -hmm. touchstone. Now that we're, I'm, I'm 70, um, you know, we're trying to preserve all that stuff and trying to sort of recreate it. So, you know, there's, there's, there's some sort of history and, and things. But um, no, I've lost my track, so put me back on track. Uh, it was really about you you were producing and distributing original artworks, but the, the question of, of, of yeah. uh, digital artworks, on the question yeah. of original yeah. artworks yeah. never arose. Yeah. I suppose the other thing was that we were, in the 60s, very concerned with trying to undermine the traditional gallery system, the, the capitalist yes. gallery system, and trying to produce art that couldn't be commercialised. Yes. And, and, um, that we didn't want to be commercialized. And so I think that we had several ambitions, and I guess from my point of view, they were coming very much from a Marxist, socialist, ideolo ideological position. Mm. And that was that art should be egalitarian, it should have a place in society, not just in rich people's living rooms. And that uh, there was a Dutch model for many years, it doesn't exist anymore, whereas if you were recognized as a professional artist, you were paid a salary by the state. Mm. 
you didn't have to sell your artwork. You could experiment and do what you liked. And I think I felt, felt, felt very dear to that. If you look at the, the role of the artist in an Aboriginal community, mm. in Australia, mm. in the Pacific Islands, mm. um, they're revered parts, members of the community. Mm. And they're, they're, you know, they're fed and housed by the community because of the mm. value of what they produce to that community. Mm. And I think that's, for me as a socialist, that's, mm. that's really how it should be. And uh, I'm old enough to know that that's sort of like pigs can fly kind of stuff. <laughs> it's a very critical point. I mean, it, there has, it seems to me there has been a tradition in, in, with some digital art of this sort of counter, counter capitalism, anti capitalist approach. Mm. After all, it's made with free software, mm. and we've gone through all the history mm. of you know, copy left and all this sort mm. of thing. Uh, and, and there are quite a few artists who, who seem to take the belief they don't want their art to become extraordinarily expensive and, and mm. just for the few people. And yet there's always this un un uncomfortable compromise that people end up making between this sort of view and actually you know, having to eat, uh, put the roof over their heads and this sort of thing. What, what's your position on that? I mean, um, I've, I've nothing against making money. Um, I'm now being approached by galleries who want to sell my work and I feel quite easy about that. Mm -hmm. um, I have always had a safety net. Um, I was an academic for most of my career, um, I worked in industry for a, a short period of time and of course now I'm retired, I've got the age pension mm -hmm. to, uh, to live on, uh, um, which isn't, you know, I, I need a new computer at present, I can't afford it, so it's not, you know, it's not perfect, but, um, so, I, th I think I've nothing against selling artwork per se, um, I still feel uneasy about people paying 50, 60 million mm. for an artwork that's going to go immediately into a coal store somewhere mm. and be brought out 20 years later to be resold at a massive profit mm. and that whole commodification of art because to me that isn't what art's about. Um, mm. You know, art is not gold or diamonds or, mm. you know, mm. stocks and shares. It's something, it, it should be something different. And we were talking about education before. I think one of the things that I've become well, it I, I concerns me about art education is that increasingly now um, colleges are teaching students how to become artistic manufacturers that sell in a commercial environment. Now, when I was a student, admittedly, it was a time of plenty. You know, Harold Macmillan, you never had it so good, and Harold Wilson's The White Heat of Technology. And um, we didn't have to worry about jobs. We were at art school and we just did what we liked and got on with our work and we never worried for a second about a job at the end of it. There'd be a couple of days teaching or something would come up. And of course now that doesn't exist. Um, students are rightly concerned on the f and they're paying huge amounts of money. I got a grant to bring up two kids, you know, for eight years through postgraduate and graduate education. Um, I mean, nowadays, students pay an awful lot of money for their education. They have to be concerned about what's that job at the end of the process? How am I going to make money at the end of the process? And the way that the, the colleges have, 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 have um, appealed to that is to teach you know, how to run yourself as a business, how to, how to market yourself and all of these kind of skills. And that does concern me a little bit because, again, um, I suppose from a 60s modernist idealistic point of view, I don't see art as about making money. I, I have this argument with my accountant at the end of the year when he's doing my tax return. He says, he says, Paul, you're claiming for all this and you haven't made any money. You know, and I'm saying, but I've had an exhibition at this prestigious gallery. And he says, that doesn't count. You know? and, and so the whole measure is, 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 is money. And I find that problematic still. It is an awkward balance though, isn't it? Because I mean, on, on the one hand, I think everybody shares that, well, many people share your feeling about money, but at the same time, nobody wants to be an artist who, whose works only go on display in his own back room. You know, it is important to get out there. Mm -hmm. um, with, with exhibitions, I mean, what, what is the, the financial angle with exhibitions? Do, do you get paid when you exhibit? Uh, or, or is it, just a it depends on the gallery. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if it's a commercial gallery, um, they don't, sh well, they can charge you rental, but at the best they don't, but then they will take about 60% mm. of whatever the work's sold for as their cut, right. and you get 40%. Um, with the, the smaller artist-run spaces, the non-commercial spaces, so Waterman's we were talking about earlier, that's Brent Council, that they own that arts centre where Waterman's is. Um, they 
would pay you to have a show there. It wouldn't be a great deal of money, but they would pay you a fee. And that would probably be recovered through grants from the Arts Council. And, uh, right. So when right. Danny and I had our show there and uh, you came to the symposium we were on, Danny and I independently applied for a grant. Um, and that paid for us to make all of the work, have it mounted and all of those right and proper things. Um, and it included a fee um, for us to have as well. And part of that grant application was a contribution from, financial contribution from Waterman's towards the cost of the exhibition overall. So that's the, the other, and then of course there's the kind of pop-up artist rent spaces where somebody will offer a, a, an old warehouse before it gets pulled down and typically the artists will, will just put those shows on and again look to philanthropic support, arts council, whatever, to pay any overheads that they need to pay. Do you, as, as far as you know, do, is, is your work in private collections, examples of your work mm. in private collections? Yeah. yeah. Do, yeah. You, do you know who the collectors are? I'd, I'd know, uh, more recently I'd know all, all of the people that bought my work. I've no idea what's happened to work that I sold mm. a long time ago and that might have gone to resale to mm. other people that I don't know about. Um, but yes, I know people that have claimed my work recently. And, and do you maintain a relationship with them? I mean, do you In general, yes, they get invitations to exhibitions. Mm. If they've bought a time-based piece, I'll offer them the next version right. um, mm. because software changes. A lot of my early work was made with uh, Macromedia Director and I think just last year uh, Adobe made the decision to stop supporting it um, and so I'm slowly converting work across from those early days into a more modern environment and offering people that I know who bought copies or that I gave copies to that I'll, I'll um, let them have uh, a new working version. What's the relationship like? I mean, are, is, is this purely between somebody who's bought something and somebody who provided it, or, or are they interested in you as an artist and what you're trying to do? I think most of the people that have bought my work, I would call friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're people that I've probably known through other channels, through maybe SIGGRAPH and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and uh, so, so it's not like it's somebody who's come in cold and, and bought a work and, and, and so on. Um, so, so we know each other as friends, mm. as well as being a collector and mm. an artist and a collector. And how do you decide what price to charge? I suppose I push it as far as I can in terms of what you know the market will bear. Mm. Um, and I guess one of the problems with uh, the prints that I do is that now they're getting a lot cheaper. But when I first started doing them, they were very expensive to produce. They, you know, they could be two hundred pounds to to get a you know. 60 by 80 centimeter mm. high fidelity archival print made, mm. which meant that, that you know you, you really had to put quite a um, a top price on that in order to recover the printing costs mm. and, and have something for yourself mm. at the end of the day. Particularly if you were selling that through a gallery, because again the gallery would have taken 60 percent of that. Mm. So if you think that if it was selling for a thousand pounds. Gallery takes 600, I get 400, and I'm paying 200 to the mm. person that printed it. You know, you can't live on that, no quite. that sort of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, uh, just one question about academic life. I'm sorry, I'm getting this, uh, jumping around a bit here. Uh, in your experience, digital art studies, if I can use the phrase digital art studies, do they always fall into the same department? You mentioned how in Goldsmiths, the, the computation computation department or the computer department took them over, uh, whereas uh, in some of the other art schools they seem to fall into, into all sorts of you know, the art department, the design department, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Does there seem to be a standard or, or is this a big area? Um, the, 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 there isn't a standard and a lot of it's run by politics and economics. Uh, so for example, I don't know if you remember, but Keating when he was Prime Minister, he was a friend of uh, Bill Gates. And Bill Gates visited um, Australia 92, 93 and said, look, you know, you've got to put some money into this, you're going to miss the boat. And so Keating put about 84 million up, which for Australia at that time, 94, was a lot of money. And I at that time was at Griffith University and of course I immediately get enlisted onto this committee that's got to try and milk as much of that 84 million as we can to set up our new programs in addressing the need for digital talent in this new electronic marketplace. And I was 
constantly being told, oh, and the graphic design department have got to have a share, and this department's got to have a share. And, you know, and the people they were putting forward, because they didn't want to put their whiz kid, you know, teachers on my side, because they needed them to teach their stuff. And I just get all this dead wood, complete tenured dead wood, yes. people who should have been set out to early retirement yes. decades before. And then, by absolute good fortune, uh, my partner, introduced me to the head of the art college at another university in Brisbane. I went for lunch with him and the vice chancellor. And they were obviously thinking, what can we do about this? And they didn't have a graphic design department. They didn't have any of those departments. And um, I remember being at that lunch and I said to him, you know, how much money have you got to spend on this? And he just looked at me dead straight and said, look, Paul, how much do you want? And so for the first time in my life, I actually could sort of write my own check um, to do this. But the other thing was that I didn't have any legacy. Yes. I could design it. Yes. And, and that's the important thing about this 40-year hiatus. Yes. You don't want people from the previous generation. You want to create an environment where this new generation can emerge through the technology yes. to determine this new aesthetic. And so that was the last course I designed. Uh, and that was in Queensland University of Technology, and a very successful course. Um, it's, it's, um, communication design. Mm. Yeah. Paul, the, you've been connected with the Computer Art Society for, for some time now. You are, in fact, at the moment the treasurer. That's right, and secretary. And secretary. Yeah, yeah. Can you, what do you think has been the impact of the CAS? It's changed. Mm. I joined the CAS when I moved to London, which would have been about 1977. Mm. I'd known it had existed before that, and I'd got some copies of Page and, and things, but I didn't really play any active role in the society. But looking back to that very early period, um, the, the, uh, Jim Haynes had set up the Drury Lane Arts Lab in 67, and when he left to go to France, the people who were there, David Curtis, John Hoppy Hopkins, and the whole of that group, uh, the Better Books people, set up this new thing, which was a, a more egalitarian model, which is the, the new arts lab, the Robert Street Arts Lab, the Institute for Research in Art and Technology um, in Robert Street in Camden. And um, one of the CAS members, John Lifton, uh, managed to get hold of a, 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 a phone coupled teletype and could run classes. The artists could go and could type in their programs. And this communicated with the Rutherford Labs, you know, the, 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 the top secret government research <laughs> labs, used their Apple supercomputer and allowed artists to do that. Now, I think that was a really good example of some of the things that, that um, Kaz did in those early days. Um, it, 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 it threw Page and Gustav's um, editing of Page. It introduced artists to what was possible with computers. And through initiatives like John's, it made it possible to use computers. And something I didn't say in a, a response to an earlier question, when I first found out about computers at Cybernetic Serendipity, what I discovered was that a lot of these companies that had computers had spare time. Mm -hmm. What they didn't have was skill to teach me how to program. Mm -hmm. And that was a big problem. Now, and I think that was one of the things that CAS did, that they were able to put skilled people, people like Alan Sutcliffe and John Lifton and others, in touch with artists and teach them how to program. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so that was a value. So that's very much part of the early part of CAS, is getting the word out enabling people to use computers, sustaining it, supporting it wherever they could. So the, 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 the Computer Arts Society began to dry up a little bit in the mid to late 80s. And um, then we had the Cache Project at Birkbeck in 2004. And as part of that, we were getting back in touch with all of the pioneers, all of the members of the Computer Arts Society. And we decided, together with them, to reform it. And so what we've had for about 14 years now is, is phase two of the Computer Arts Society. And this has a much different role, I think, because mm. you can go out and buy a Raspberry Pi for 30 quid. I mean, it's mm. not hard to get hold of computers or learn exactly. how to program them. You know, and there's lots of things you can download that help you to learn how to program. So what we've become is much more concerned with archiving, uh, making sure that artists aren't forgotten, that their work's protected and stuff like that. And I think that's, um, that's much more at the core of what we do now as a society, um, is maintain an international presence, keep artists in touch with each other, and uh, build, build this archive, which we're working on right now. You know, Sean is working on right now. And you've also got these connections with Eva and with the Lumen Prize and That's things right. like that, which yeah. 
it's difficult to say exactly who is doing what, but somehow they all the, the, the synergy yeah. is, is is clearly quite fruitful. Yeah, and with Isaiah uh, the, 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 Sue Golifer, who's the director of the Isaiah organisation, um, she runs it out of Brighton. Mm -hmm. um, uh, university. She's on our committee as well. So with the, there's a lot of interaction. Uh, Roger Molina at uh, Leonardo has been a good friend of mine for, for many years now. So we are, we're all talking to each other. Um, yeah. mm. uh, how do you see the, uh, <laughs> that's a silly question really, the next 50 years at CAS? Where would you like to see it go? I think I see it, uh, and it'll be interesting to see what other people answer this, but for me it's very much about preserving things. Um, so having some publication outlet that allows us to keep people's memory alive, um, having an archive that allows us to preserve the work or introducing it to like one of the really good things that we've done in the last 14 years is have a very strong relationship with Doug Dodds at the Victoria and Albert Museum and he and Melanie Lenz and uh, Irene and I think Anna, Anna Bedard was there for a while. Um, we just had this very good relationship where we were able to arrange for the Patrick Prince collection to be donated to the v and um, or uh, then the Computer Arts Society. And we've still got that relationship where we can feed into I that. I think that collection is actually on display at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, there's, uh, there's an exhibition market. at the uh, v and called Chance and Control, and selections from that yes. collection yes. are on, on show there. Yeah. Yes, I haven't managed to get there yet, but I certainly intend mm. to. I mean, do, do you think that uh, what sort of changes would you like to see in, in, in society more widely? It's, that's a silly <laughs> question. I mean, more money, a different attitude towards computer art, a different attitude towards uh, art generally, or, or, or what sort of thing would you like to see? If you well, like I suppose to I would like to see a move away from the capitalisation of art. Uh, yes. Because, you know, as I said before, you know, rich people buy these things and put them in vaults mm. and maybe loan them to a very mm. prestigious museum so long as there's a huge insurance tab to be picked up. Mm. And then they go back in the vault they brought out for resale mm. some years later. And um, I suppose that, you know, it's just part of life, but it does seem to me to be a very negative way of looking at it. Mm. And I suppose as a socialist, you know, I do look forward to a more egalitarian mm. form of art, um, mm. something where you've got your television and when it's not switched on, artworks can be played that have been yes. made especially for that environment yes. and they don't cost you anything. They yes. came with, or with, with your yes. license fee or you know, whatever yes. the purchase cost of the, uh, uh, of the television. Um, as a socialist, I'm also not optimistic. I think socialism is in, a, in, in an awful state globally mm. right now. I'm very interested to see what Cuba does in the post-Castro mm. era, mm. whether it manages to hold on to socialism, because you know very few other countries have. They've, mm. they've all turned, mm. turned over to capitalism. And I do see capitalism as a very negative force. I mean, I, I, I think it's a, uh, it's a form of slavery. It's, you know, it's, it's where rich people enslave poor people. Mm. And I don't like that at all. No, no. I suppose one other question that, that does come to mind is, is how you establish standards. You know, I mean, is there a difference between good digital art and bad di digital art? And, and in a world which is so fluid, where everybody is making up their own rules all the time, mm -hmm. how do you actually draw a line and say, well, this is good and this is bad? Mm -hmm. I think that happens anyway. I taught for a while in Mississippi, mm -hmm. and uh, one of my colleagues had been educated in Moscow in socialist realism. He was from the old Soviet days, mm -hmm. and so he'd been trained as a Soviet uh, socialist realist. Mm -hmm. I'd come out of the European tradition of, of you know, socialist supported art. You know, it, art doesn't make money, it's about exploring ideas. And of course, everybody else on the team had come out of Southern America, um, where you're very much taught to, you know, art looks good on the wall and you sell it to people to, you know, match the furniture. 